Alaska Insight is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers just like you. Thank you. What's the best plan for Alaska's future? Three candidates running to be Alaska's next governor all think they have the right answers. Tonight, we'll hear the ideas of Democrat Mark Begich. What does he think is needed to create jobs, attract and retain a well-trained workforce, and stabilize state funds into the future? We'll ask this evening on Alaska Insight. Good evening. Tonight on Alaska Insight, we continue our series with the leading candidates campaigning to be Alaska's next governor. Last week, we heard from Republican Mike Dunleavy, and this week it's Democrat Mark Begich's turn to discuss what compelled him to seek the job as Alaska's top elected leader. So who is Mark Begich, the Alaskan, rather than the politician? Alaska Public Media's Zachariah Hughes visited the Begich home recently and brings us this profile. These conference. But all these are pieces of art that over the years we've collected. Mark Begich's unassuming Anchorage home is filled with a lifetime's worth of art, photos, and mementos from all around Alaska. When I worked in a jewelry store when I was 18, 19, I started buying ivory and so a piece like that. The 56-year-old and his wife, Deborah Benito, married in 1990. This is the, the photo that my son always says, why did mom marry you with hair like that? <laughs> Begich is a lifelong Anchorageite, and he's quick to point out a parochial pride in the east side of town, where he grew up and has stayed. Yeah. He bristles at the presumption that his political achievements led him to abandon his home turf for tonier neighborhoods closer to City Hall. It was actually one of my neighbors here, one of the kids said to me one day when I won the mayor's race, they said, so does that mean you move downtown? And I said, no, I don't move downtown. Begich comes from a large political family. His father was Alaska's congressman in 1972 when his plane disappeared flying to Juneau. His own political career started in Anchorage's assembly when he was 26. I got into the assembly running for office because I got frustrated with a road I lived on in East Anchorage off of Muldoon, it wasn't paved. Everyone else got paved streets except mine. He mounted a modest campaign and won the seat, going on to serve for around a decade on the body before eventually serving two terms as Anchorage's mayor. This, I think, was uh, election day when I ran for mayor. Five years later, Begich ran to unseat longtime Alaska Republican Senator Ted Stevens and won, serving a full term. Outside of politics, he maintains a constellation of activities falling somewhere between business, hobbies, and passion projects. I like working with my hands because you can see outcomes. Because the other end of the world is um, sometimes in politics it takes years to see an outcome. Uh, I'm also a serial entrepreneur. There's also his peculiar hobby of civic vigilanteism. Begich will often drive around town with paint in his truck, spotting graffiti and painting over it. This is the uh, big old roller rink, but it's on Cross McDonald's on Arctic and uh, Benson. So I ended up doing that. I just can't stand it. It, it perpetuates more crime. You know, like when you see that, it says to someone, no one respects this place. So then something else might happen. While this stems from a certain brand of hometown pride, Begich says he also took it with him to the Capitol, painting over tags on the streets of Washington, D.C. when he lived there, too. He's previously held elected office as Anchorage's mayor and as one of Alaska's U.S. senators. Democrat Mark Begich is running to be Alaska's next governor, and he joins me now to talk about his vision for Alaska's future. Mr. Begich, welcome. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Well, let's start with what your top three priorities would be if you are elected governor. What would you focus on right away? Absolutely. And this is what I hear all across the state. Crime is the number one issue across the state. 
education and making sure we have an education system that works. We're now number 46 out of 50 in the states, uh, so we need to do better. And third is how do we continue to grow the economy and how do we ensure that there are future jobs here, not only for Alaskans today, but for generations to come. And then one that is overarching uh, is the PFD. What's going to happen with the permanent fund dividend? Is it going to be secure? Is it going to be sustainable? And will it last for generations to come? Those are the kind of the four, I know you said three, but four issues that uh, we'll be focused on. So let's drill down a little bit. Uh, take the first one, crime. Mm -hmm. um, earlier this week, you were on Talk of Alaska. We heard people express frustration, both in urban and rural right. Alaska, about rates of crime. What would you do? Well, this is, you know, it's, it's amazing to me. You know, I was born and raised in East Anchorage. I played at Gravel Pit Lake and played kick the can outside. Never worried about these kind of issues. Our family never did. Today, it's a much different place, Alaska. And we hear this everywhere now, the crime issue. So there's a couple things you can do right away. First off, there are over 40 positions that aren't filled today in the troopers that are fully funded. We need to fill them. Corrections has another 20 positions, again, fully funded, unfilled. So while you're working to fill those and creating new abilities to recruit people for those positions, we need to also have a much more coordinated effort from our state perspective. I would form a cabinet underneath our overall cabinet, a public safety cabinet, which would have public safety, corrections, court, as well as health and human services working together to figure out how to go after this issue. And here's just a couple creative ideas. For example, we know that in the drug trade, it's, it's like a business to these drug dealers. And so you gotta break it and disrupt it in some way that's pretty aggressive. I did this when I was mayor, I would do the same thing in the state government. I would love to have two prosecutors maybe that are state paid for, but assigned to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Why would I do that? Because then we can prosecute them under federal law. And if you're dealing drugs and, and you're, in, you know, you're dealing drugs and you have guns, the, you're going to get a 10-year mandatory sentence and you're going to be shipped out of state. You're not going to stay in our court systems here. You're not going to get out in 60 days. You're not going to get probation. You're out. Why is that important? Because now you break the cycle and disrupt the business of drug trade. And these folks don't like that. If you talk to police officers when I was mayor and we did something similar to this, it changed the dynamics. Less people were dealing drugs, crime started to go down. The other thing we need to do is help our village police officers get the credentials they need, the training they need, and also a little experience with our urban police officers. I would love to do an exchange program where we bring village police officers into urban areas like Fairbanks, Anchorage, Juneau, to learn and, and mentor with police officers on the ground here and do the reverse. I would love the urban area police officers also see what's going on in rural Alaska. Uh, we also need to focus on uh, first time offenders and substance abuse. There are many that are 80% of the people in corrections now are dealing with substance abuse in some form or another. But we also know some are feeding their substance abuse habit with crime. And the net result is they do one crime, maybe they get off, or maybe they don't get anything, and then they do another and another, and before you know it, they're deep into crime. If we can figure out how to deal with some of the first time offenders, we did this again when I was mayor working with the state, I would reverse this and have what we call a wellness court where we can engage people who want to help themselves and get on the right track and bring them into the right uh, process rather than just throwing them back in the jail. But you got to be tough and you also have to be uh, sensitive to where you can change the course of someone to get them into a better lifestyle and a sense of what they're dealing with. But it's multifaceted. You can't just have one single thing. Most people talk about, let's just get rid of SB 91. That's the topic. 91 has a lot of problems and it should be repealed. Keep a few things that are strong in there, but that doesn't solve the problem. I, I've heard you mention mm. the, the 40 trooper positions yeah. uh, earlier this week on Talk of Alaska. If those are identified as needed positions, why are they still why open? Still what, what, why do you think that, that we are having trouble filling these positions? Well, I don't think the legislature or the governor focused on this as a priority. I mean, the crime issue has slowly been going up in the last four years has gotten worse. We're number one in the nation when it comes to crime, totally unacceptable. And the recruitment methods is kind of the old style. You know, they show up at a job fair, hope people find them. They have to go through this cumbersome uh, process in the state government to get on the list to go through the process. I think there are better ways. I met with some troopers down in the southeast. They gave me some great ideas how to bring in um, new employees within and how they can recruit and some techniques they have there. But we need to go out. You know, if you think about millennials today, they're not going to sit around and go to a job fair. You got to go where they are. You got to find 
where those avenues of entrance are. When I was mayor, we recruited police officers on, on military bases, we went to churches, we went everywhere we could. Instead of waiting for them to come to us, we went to them, showed them this great career opportunity. But we also have to look at our education system, how to match it up. What I want to find is those 10th, 11th, 12th graders in school who really are interested in public safety, or maybe they're in a ROTC program, you know, maybe they're doing something that they want to serve their state, their country, their community. Let's figure out how to move them into programs where we're mentoring them so when they come out of high school that maybe this is the career they want to go to. We're not thinking that way. What we're doing is always just kind of plug in the gap and hope it all works. The other thing we've got to do on uh, the, the uh, troopers is we cannot continue to have this 401k retirement system because it's basically people get hired, they serve for five years, they get their money from the state match and they go off to other, pro other uh, states to get their jobs because we don't have a defined uh, retirement benefit. So there's no guarantee. And people say, well, the younger generation doesn't, aren't concerned about that. That is, that is absolutely wrong. People want to, I talk to these young troopers and they say, hey, five years in, after I get my 401k matched by the state, I'll look for another career somewhere else where I get a defined benefit. We spend $125,000, $150,000 to train up these folks. Let's figure out how to give them a benefit that they will stay as a career, not just a stop off. You've expressed support for Ballot Measure 1, mm -hmm. designed the idea behind it is uh, to protect salmon streams. The resource industry, as you know, has a lot of heartburn about this. Uh, their concern, uh, the oil and gas industry, is that it will shut down new projects or make permitting so expensive that uh, those projects may be shelved. Are you concerned about that? Are you concerned that this could have a chilling effect on oil, gas, or mining? No, I don't. And I, and I say this, you know, there's so much uh, in politics today, this kind of fear baiting where people just lay, lay out the worst case scenario of everything and hope that people, you know, vote no because of a fear. You know, 45,000 people signed an initiative to put this on the ballot because the legislature and the governor failed to do their job. There was a piece of legislation that they could have modified, worked on, gone through the process, and if they would have, they could have prevented this initiative from going on the ballot. You know, this law, Title 16, hasn't been revised since pre-statehood. A lot of things have changed with our environment and technology and science and what we should be looking at. The courts reviewed this. They took out the things that were uh, concerns to a lot of the industry in a sense of the prescriptive kind of detail of the initiative. But at the end of the day, the way I look at this initiative, it's really a right to know. People should know if you do a mega project in your state that there is a state process that allows you to comment on it. Or if they say they're going to mitigate these things and do certain things with their project, they're, they're held to that standard. There's a process to make sure that occurs. When they pull a permit that you're actually notified as a community, I think those are good things to allow people to have the right to, to decide on. But more the reason why I support this is the legislature failed. The governor failed. Earlier this week, we were at Anchorage Chamber of Commerce, and the, both of them talked about how the legislative process should have worked this out. Well, that'd been great. Neither one of them did anything about it. They now complain about it. Well, here's the result. Because of their inaction, inability to do their job, now the voters got a little frustrated. Now it's on the ballot for today. And voters get the right to make these decisions. And, and I don't, you know, I, I'll give you one example, or two, but I'll give you one quick one. Ship Creek, when I became mayor of Anchorage, Ship Creek had a lot of problems. The, the banks were deteriorating, it was becoming an environmental problem, fisheries were being harmed, tourists were overriding it. We got together with the Sierra Club and the Chamber and put together a proposal how to revamp that whole fisheries down there, working together to solve these problems. We didn't have some initiative. We actually worked it out, solved it, and you go down there to Ship Creek now, it's an incredible $6 million fisheries, and here's two groups that totally oppose each other. Actually, I had to sit in between them at the press conference in order to make sure they weren't going to say wrong things to each other, because they were all together on the same thing, how to revisit this the right way. So. Well, let's uh, follow up on that. You've sure. expressed support for bringing back the Coastal Zone Management Absolutely. Program. Absolutely. Give just a sentence about what that is for <laughs> folks who don't know or don't remember when it was in place and yeah. why you think that's important now. Well, the interesting thing, you know, Alaska has three quarters of the coastal uh, lands of this country. Coastal Zone Management allows the local 
government, the states, to manage their coastal area. Alaska gave that up, gave it back to the federal government, which is insane. Why would we give away our ability to manage our coastal areas to the federal government? We should have that responsibility. Along with that comes millions of dollars that we can then utilize to create value to our coast, making sure they're preserved and protected and cleaning them up, whatever we think is the right thing we want to do with that resource. But both Senator Dunleavy and Governor Walker failed to take action on this. They both opposed this idea. I, I don't understand why you wouldn't want local control as a state to make sure people aren't doing things to your coast. I mean, think about it. Fisheries, an important part of our coastal areas and the value, tourism, even oil and gas, which is on our coast. To give the right up is ridiculous to me. So one of the first things I'll do, I'll introduce legislation because that's what it's going to take in order to get us back to manage our own coastal areas. And then it takes a federal process to make sure that we can continue to move forward. But we're the highest recipients of dollars in the United States for the Coastal Zone Management Program. But now we're not because we gave up our rights. And I think it's a question of sovereignty, our state's rights, and our ability to manage our own coast, and we should do it. Speaking of sovereignty, there was an attorney general, state attorney general's opinion in 2014, I believe, that uh, affirmed and clarified the state's perception of tribal sovereignty and acknowledging that tribes do have sovereignty as, as independent governments. Mm -hmm. What do you think that relationship should be between state government and tribal government, especially as it relates to law enforcement and the ability of tribes to leverage federal dollars to yeah. their communities. How, what should that authority be as it relates to tribal governments? Well, first off, I've always supported it, and I've always recognized that tribes are sovereign government, and it's a relationship, a government-to-government -government relationship. I believe that when I was in the Senate. I believed it when I was mayor. We have these unique relationships. So, first off, I think there's some great opportunities. You know, we do it with healthcare. We do it to some degree, obviously, with public safety. We need to do more in this arena. They're developing new ideas and utilizing their tribal courts in a way that has been positive in many communities. I think we can expand that into more areas around substance abuse and those issues that are becoming more of a challenge for us in rural Alaska. But also, I see some economic opportunities. I met with a tribe down in the southeast that runs a lab that does. Um, fisheries analysis, in other words, certain types of diseases and so forth, and they do for several communities. The state doesn't have the resources totally to do the lab work on their fisheries, so why don't we create a compact with that lab as an example, say let's do a relationship with you, let's do an agreement with you so you manage this on behalf of the state. I think there are a lot of opportunities here. They talked about some ideas around education, um, which I think is a great opportunity because when you think of rural areas which have a low population community and a potential of losing their school because this population is too small. What are those partnerships we can do with the tribe to ensure they have proper education within their community? So I think there's some really unique uh, uh, opportunities for us as a state to partner and to utilize compacts in a way with our tribes that can bring us to a much better level and much stronger communities in rural Alaska. Uh, hopping around the state a bit. Um, <laughs> southeast, That's what you do in campaigns. So. <laughs> southeast Alaska relies heavily on the marine highway system. Yes. And mm. the, the ferry system has had cuts and cuts and cuts to communities, mm -hmm. uh, the number of runs, the communities that are visited. That has an economic effect on these communities, makes things more expensive. It's harder for people to get around. The fast ferries are, are being taken offline. What do you think needs to happen in this regard in the yeah. future up against the fact that uh, we also need to talk about revenues in the budget? What right. should happen with the ferry system? Well, first off, you know, I always, and you said it correctly, it's the high marine highway system. You know, that it, it, it is part of our highway system throughout the state. It just happens to be on a ferry and the connectivity. I think there's been, it's always treated like a second class citizen in the sense of transportation. When you hear the legislature or the governor talk, you always hear him talk about roads and bridges, which are important. But this is another piece of the equation. It needs to be equal to that conversation. So when we think of, and I've laid out an idea of a capital budget of a six-year bond that I would put on the ballot that would be voted on in one year to give us two-plus billion dollars of investment, utilizing existing resources to pay its debt, no new money necessary. But in that equation, it's not just about roads and bridges. It's also about the ferry system. What do we need to invest in that? 
I think we also need to step back a little bit and say, what do we want this marine highway system to look like? What we've been doing every year is fighting the issues of how much money can we get this year versus next year. We also have contracts with some of the working folks that are running these that have been in negotiations for almost two years. Totally unacceptable. We need to resolve these issues so we have a workforce focused on making this the best marine highway system in the country because there's others around the country that utilize ferries for transportation. We can do better. When I was in the Senate, I worked with the Washington delegation, the Washington State delegation, to add more money from the federal end to improve the marine highway system. As they were improving theirs, we got some for Alaska. We need to not only figure it out in state, but we should be working with our federal delegation to figure out what more we can do. I will tap friends of mine, not only with our delegation, but my friends in Washington and Oregon and others that are U.S. senators to see what we can do to improve this funding stream from the federal government to match what we're doing on the state government. So we get treated no longer as a second class citizen, our marine highway system, but equal to transportation across the state. Let's talk a little about the budget and uh, where you think new revenues need to come from to stabilize it. Is it going to be taxes? What needs to happen? Give us some defined ideas sure. about what you'd like to see revenue-wise yeah. for the state. Well, first off, there's three uh, pieces to the puzzle, in my view. First off, you have to deal with the permanent fund dividend. If you don't have that off the table, you're going to have this debated every single year, how big the dividend, how small the dividend, whatever they will do. So my proposal is first, you take, uh, right now there's about $18 billion in the earnings reserve. This money can be tapped by the legislature by a simple majority vote, which is very dangerous. Leaving in their hands means that money is going to be all gone and the end result will be, will be in worse shape 10 years from now. So first thing is take a size amount, put it in the corpus of the fund so only the public can deal with it. Second, uh, you got to constitutionally guarantee a sustainable dividend. I would take the percent of market value formula, 50% of it goes to a sustainable dividend that guarantees it for this generation and multiple generations. Then the second half of the money I would use to replace general fund money and use it for education funding, K through 12 plus accessing pre-K, not diminishing any money for K through 12, basically doing what we should have been doing decades ago. Then you look at the state government overall operationally. There are opportunities for efficiencies. I've seen it talking to employees. I gave one example earlier this week on your show about two computer systems running at public assistance side by side for three and a half years. And the reason they won't shut one down is they're afraid the other one might not work. Well, both those contractors should be fired. We should have one system. There's a lot of that inefficiency within state government. The workers are doing a great job. It's just the top people are not doing what they should be doing. And last, if you need revenues, we'll, we're gonna have to deal with it. And it's gonna have to be a combination, is my bet. Right now, you don't have 11 senators and 21 House members. This is what you need to get a revenue issue passed, supporting anything right now in a, in a majority vote. But it's gonna be probably, you know, people have talked about sales tax, gas tax, uh, uh, income tax, they've talked about a seasonal tax, all those things. Two things I will not support. I will not support a wage tax because that hurts working people. It's disproportionate. It's the most regressive uh, income tax I've ever seen. And I will not support a gas tax. And the reason for that is it hurts people who, again, working folks as well as people in rural Alaska. I mean, as you know, in rural Alaska, fuel, maybe like it or not, is a big part of the economy out there for their homes and everything else. And so we need to lower the cost, not add to it. Only have about 30 seconds left. Sure. Do you think the LNG plan is viable? Will the gas line be built? Would you support it? You know, I, I support the concept of the pipeline. I think there's a lot of challenges. We don't know a lot of the details because they're not disclosing them. What, what did we give up to get Exxon to sign on and BP and others to sign on? I don't know what that all is. But we have to put this in perspective. Just doing the pipeline does not solve our problems in growing the economy. It is not the end all to everything and not the answer for everything. It's one piece of the puzzle. We need to grow our economy, fight crime, grow and improve our education system. There's so much more we should be focused on. And if we're just going to focus on the pipeline, it's not enough. People can go to my website, learn more, baggage.com. Thank you, Mark Baggage, Democrat candidate for governor, for being with me on Alaska Insight this evening. Thank you very much. You've just heard from Democrat Mark Begich, one of three candidates campaigning to be Alaska's next governor. Next week, the incumbent independent Bill Walker will join us for Alaska Insight. 
And you can watch this program again, as well as last week's edition featuring Republican Mike Dunleavy on alaskapublic.org slash alaskainsight. Each week on Alaska Insight, Alaska Public Media will go into the community to go beyond the headlines and provide perspective on the issues that have Alaskans talking. You can watch Alaska Insight online at our website or stream episodes of Alaska Insight on AK Passport. You can also engage with us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Your comments help us determine future topics of discussion. We return next Friday at 7.30 p.m. right after Washington week. In the meantime, stay informed and connected by listening to Morning Edition, Alaska News Nightly, and Talk of Alaska on your locally owned and operated public radio station. Thanks for joining Alaska Public Media for this edition of Alaska Insight. I'm Lori Townsend. Good night. <laughs>